may be seated. Well, this has been quite the journey in this series, Supernatural, and uh, we're going to be finishing up the series today, and we're going to be talking about angels. But nevertheless, no matter what we talk about in perspective of the supernatural, here is the truth. We win. Amen? Amen. We win. We live in the victory of Jesus Christ. But as we've walked through this, if you're just joining us today, let me just do a, a quick recap of where we've been. First week, we recognized that we live in truly a, a physical world. But we also have come to realize that the spiritual world is just as real. And we need to make note of this spiritual realm. Because God has called us to live in the spirit. To know that we are not just physical, but we are also spiritual. And we learned in the second week, in the third week, that we have this gifting of the spirit of God that is able to dwell within us, to give us a supernatural understanding, to help us realize that we're not fighting against people, against flesh and blood, but the battle, the real battle, is against the powers, the powers of darkness. But God has given us the ability to overcome all of this. The reality of the Holy Spirit is to be manifested in each of our lives, that we're not called to walk in a natural state, but we're called to walk in a supernatural state that comes from His Spirit. And then last week, Jeff, as he always does, did a tremendous job laying it out about this dark side, the demonic influence that is there, teaching us that there is a real battle, and he is coming to kill, steal, and destroy anything that is good in your life. We know this battle, but today we're going to finish this particular series talking about God's supernatural beings, angels. And the thing about angels is that there's a lot of misunderstanding. People have a lot of mistruths about what angels are, who they are, what they do. We're going to take time this morning to see the significance of angels in the spiritual world, but also angels in our world, our physical world, and to see what that looks like. Because here's the thing that I've come to realize. The common understanding of angels is all over the place. Where do we gather our understanding? We turn on the television, right? We get on Yahoo, and, and that tells us exactly what angels are. I mean, we used to watch the, that show, Touched by an Angel, and we watch it and say, oh, surely that's what it is because it's on television, so it has to be real, right? No. Or we watch uh, movies, uh, one in particular, It's a Wonderful Life, and that fam famous saying from Clarence, every time a bell rings, what happens? Oh, man, you guys are good. That, that's biblical, right? No, not so much, all right? But see, we take this, we take these perspectives and we make them our reality. Maybe you're one of those that have received a card and it has that little naked baby, bald-headed thing playing a harp on a cloud. And maybe you've received that. And maybe you've come to say, well, surely that's what angels are because here it is. It's portrayed, this little naked, bald baby playing a harp. Well, I'm telling you, the truth is, all it is is a naked baby, bald, playing a harp. It is not an angel. That is not what they're portrayed as. Not even close. But yet, so many of us want to believe it because we've been told that's what it is. And some people, I mean, God love you, believe that, you know, when... Uh, when one of your relatives that you actually like dies, they become an angel. They become my guardian angel. No, there is no biblical backing or teaching that gives us any evidence of that. As much as we'd like to think that my grandma is watching over me, no, God is watching over me. And that's all that I need. That's all that I need. And so many times we get these perspectives so messed up 
And the adversary has such a great time with confusing us. But you know, we're going to look and begin to understand that these angels are God's servants. These angels were created for God and for his glory. Do we benefit from them? Absolutely, because God loves us. But as we lay this out, we'll begin to see how amazing they are. They're amazingly fierce. They're not a little bald-headed baby. They're fierce. But yet, in the same sense, they're gentle enough to care for even a child. Angels are absolutely amazing. But as we've looked at this, you know, it's one extreme and the other. You got the demons and Satan, and then you got angels. You got this battle going on, and you're sitting there going, man, what is this? I can't see it. But yet it's real. Did you realize that there's only three angels that are mentioned in the Bible by name? Michael, Gideon, and Satan. That's it. That is it. But yet, I want us to turn to Revelation. Revelation 12, 7, kind of lays some things out for us. It says, Then there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. The dragon lost the battle, and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent, called the devil, or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown to the earth with all his angels. Real battle is going on in the supernatural. But you know, there are many names that we throw at Satan. Great dragon, serpent, devil. But there's one in particular that I think many times we don't understand the connection that's going on here. If you turn with me to Isaiah 14, 12, I'm going to read off the back because it's, it's the New King James Version of this. The name that we often come across is Lucifer. Where does that come from? If Lucifer is this fallen angel, how do we connect the dots? When Isaiah 14, 12, it says this, and it's not on the back wall. <laughs> okay, how are, you, how are you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? It's interesting when you hear this word. Now, the New King James takes it in this context, but what I want to teach you is this. If you look at this in the Hebrew context, there's this word, it's called hele, okay? And what it is, is it can be, it can become Lucifer when we translate it. It could be morning star. But there's something significant about this that many of you may miss in this. What do you think angels are about? Do you think they're about the same thing we are, that we're to reflect the glory of God? Absolutely. Angels were created to carry the attributes and characters of God, to bring glory to him. So yes, they're going to look like the reflection of God in Christ himself. So let's look at this. It's interesting. If you turn with me to Revelation 22, 16, this is from the NIV, and I want to read that to you. It says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and that bright morning star. Now, how can it be that Lucifer, Satan, is considered the morning star, and so is Jesus? How does this work? Well, again, 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 listen. Angels are to be the reflection of their creator, an image of their creator. And Jesus created the angels. But did you notice something in here? Bright morning star. What is it? It's capitalized. The fallen angel, Lucifer, was a morning star, a reflection of his creator. And that is what Satan always wants to do, is take the place of his creator. I mean, think about it. Jesus is called the Lion of Judah. Satan is referred to a roaring lion. He's always trying to steal what is rightly Christ. But yet he doesn't win, does he? But many of us would say, Jesus was called Lucifer? If you look at the context, yes. There's a correlation there. But we identify it and we connect it solely to Satan, don't we? But Jesus is saying, I am the great morning star. I'm the one you want to watch. But this reflection, this attribute, is something that we all have to carry. But it's interesting because angels are mentioned over 250 times in Scripture. 
So don't you think it's kind of important that we kind of look at this, kind of understand who they are and what they do? And that's what we're going to do this morning. So the first question is, who are angels? And I want you to realize something about angels. We have a lot in common with them. We really do. Because if we are made in the image of God, there's some things that are going to make some connections here. The first one, angels are worshipers. Are we not also worshipers? You see the correlation? There's a close connection here. That we're to worship God. But I want you to turn with me to Hebrews 1, 6. In verse 6 it says, And when he brought his supreme son into the world, God said, Let all God's angels worship him. That is what he desired. That all this creation, the angels, were created to worship his son. To come before him as we are. But also, when you look over in Revelation, chapter 5, John is having this supernatural encounter. He's being exposed to things that we have never seen. But yet he walks through this and writes about his experience with God. And in this chapter, chapter 5, verse 11, listen to this. Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is a lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. This is what they were created for, to bring honor and blessing to the king. They're worshipers. And the more that we understand about who Jesus is, we too should be greater worshipers. We should find ourselves on our knees, worshiping. But here's the thing I want you to hear. A lot of people love their angels. And I'm not saying that you can't have a little remnant of an angel somewhere. But make sure it's the right perspective. Angels are not to be worshipped. We hold them in high regards. Jesus is the only one that is to be held in high regard. No one else. But yet... They're fierce and they're powerful. So surely they deserve worship, right? Well, turn over with me. Chapter 22. Let's see what the word has to say about this. Revelation 22, John himself experiencing this incredible power. Verse 8. I, John, and the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, no. Don't worship me. I am a servant of God, just like you and your brothers, the prophets, as well as all who obey what is written in this book. Worship only. Come on, we need to be a little more convincing than this. Worship only. God. That's right. We've got to keep the right perspective about the supernatural. Because anything that is bigger than us is overwhelming. But we're not to worship. We're not to pray to angels. We're to pray for angels, yes. Meaning that we need them to help us, to guide us, give us life. And I'm going to walk this through with you. The second point is this. Angels are warriors. And there is a correlation to what we are called to be. We're to be called warriors also. But angels are warriors. Now, a couple weeks ago, we talked about Daniel. In Daniel 10, he was faced with this incredible war. He didn't know what to do. And he began to pray. He said, Lord, if you don't show up, I don't know what's going to happen. And as soon as he began to pray, he didn't pray for angels, but he prayed that God would help him. And in that moment, they heard the prayers. And God sent his angels, but they didn't come right away. It was like 21 days because there's a real spiritual war going on. Satan didn't want him to be encouraged. But yet Michael came and took on the battle and allowed another angel to come and give him the truth. Give him the understanding that I am with you. That you will find victory in me. But it wasn't just there. We see this all throughout the word. In, in 2 Kings, this is an incredible account. We, we have uh, King Hezekiah. And he's dealing with a, a challenge here. What's happening here? As he prays, and he prays for deliverance. He prays for Judah's deliverance. 
he understands that the Assyrian army is coming in and they're, they're overtaking them. There's no way that we can do this battle. What is going to happen here? And what we see here in one simple verse, 2 Kings 19, verse 35, it says, That night the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpse, corpses everywhere. So it's not just about a spiritual battle. The angels were able to step into the physical realm and do something that was unbelievable. 185,000 people were killed by one angel. You think we need to pay attention? Do you think we need to understand their role in power? They're warriors, and they're fighting for the right reasons. But then we go back, and we look again at Revelation 12, 7 and 9. Let's read it again. Then there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. This was a real thing happening, a real battle. And we need the warriors to show up. Not just in the spiritual, but also in the physical world. But see, we're called to fight the battle, aren't we? Aren't we called to put on the armor of God? We have a lot in common with angels. We are to be warriors for the faith of God. But the other thing is this, the third element. Angels are messengers. I think we're familiar with this. I think we've seen this dynamic in Scripture, and maybe even in our own lives, over and over again, you see angels showing up. And when they show up, they often have a message for God's people, for his purpose to be known. There's a great example of this in the Old Testament in the book of Judges. And Gideon was, was afraid. It's kind of a, a thing that we kind of do as humans. We kind of have this fear factor, and God knew it. But in this particular moment, Gideon was afraid. He was scared to death of the Midianites. In fact, he was so scared he was hiding. He was a coward at that moment. Maybe you would see it that way. But this is what I realize when, when we really allow God to intervene. In Judges 6, 12, in this moment, it says this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. He did not feel like a mighty hero, but sometimes we need to be reminded that we're able to do more than we could ever hope or imagine. And God is going to send in that messenger to remind us who we are in that battle. And in fact, he was reminded that he was a hero. In fact, he, rem he was reminded that you're going to win this battle. You're going to destroy them. In fact, the battle's going to go like this. You're going to fight them, and it's going to be as if you're fighting one man. How does that happen? I think we just learned that an angel can take out 185,000 warriors by one. So God has his ways of doing battle for us and with us. So where do we go with this? What does this messenger look like? Well, there was another great message that was given by an angel. I mean, we're kind of coming into the Christmas season, no surprise. But in Luke chapter 1, verse 30, we have this incredible encounter. This young girl has this encounter with an angel. And in verse 30, it says, Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. What an incredible encounter with an angel. What a moment it made for her. So what do angels look like? I mean, are they glowing? Do they wear white robes? I mean, we, we hear all these things. We see all these things. I mean, do they show up just like you and me? Well, I think yes to all of that, possibly. When you look at Hebrews, Hebrews 13, it gives us this indication. In verse 2, it says, Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this, have entertained angels without realizing it. And you're thinking, oh, whoa, that's kind of wild. And it is kind of wild. But see, God is not limited by what we can understand. The ability for angels to take on the image of a man or a light or glow or whatever that is, God can choose what is right in that moment, what is needed in that moment. 
So we've looked at who are angels. We've got somewhat of an idea who they are. But I think we need to ask another question. What is it that they really do? What is their real purpose? I mean, we know that they are worshipers. We know that they're able to uh, be a warrior and a messenger. But what else is there? What else do we need to realize? I think the first thing is this. Angels give direction. They're not just messengers. They also give direction in that message. And I think it's very important that we see this. For example, uh, we just looked at this little teenage girl, Mary. And she was approached by an angel and says, oh, you're going to give birth by the Holy Spirit? And then she has to go tell her fiancé, oh, by the way, um, I'm going to be a mama. And he's thinking, um, I wasn't there. Uh, how's this happening? You know? And, and he stands in that moment of doubt. Every one of us stands in moments of doubt, moments of fear, wondering, is God really in this? Well, he gave direction to Joseph, didn't he? We look in Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. It says, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For this child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So the angel showed up in a dream. He showed up face to face to Mary. He showed up in a dream to Joseph. And both of them seemed as if they were real because they were God is not limited by what we can fully comprehend. But we do have to see the truth for which it comes. It's hard. I get it. And I can remember a time when I was a freshman at seminary. I wrestled with going into ministry. I'll be honest with you. It's been one of those things I'm like, I don't want to do this, Lord. I, don't want to, I really don't want to do this. But I kept going because I kept feeling his movement. But I know this one particular day, and you don't have to believe me or not. I don't care. I know what I know. I did not want to be in college anymore, in seminary. I wanted to quit. I wanted to do something different. And I can remember going down that particular day to Skyline in, in Cincinnati and sitting in this back corner by myself, overwhelmed with, what's my parents going to think? You know, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? How am I going to keep this rolling? And I was just sitting there overwhelmed. And all of a sudden, this gentleman walks in. Looks like a homeless man. And he walks in, he walks back towards me, and he sits down in my booth. I'm sitting there going, okay, this is weird. Okay, this is weird. And he begins to tell me things about my life. He begins to tell me that, that God wants me to continue to move forward, that God has a plan for me. He starts laying all this stuff out, and I'm sitting there going, I can't even talk. I'm so overwhelmed with it, I'm sitting there going, this doesn't make sense. What I see is a homeless man, but what I hear is God's voice. How is that happening? And I finally got enough strength to get out of that booth and I excused myself when I went to the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I'm sitting there going okay this is weird okay this is weird you know I'm 19 years old this is weird and then I come back out and he's gone I walk out the door I look up and down the road and he's gone but I know it was God sending an angel to speak a message and give me direction to tell me to stay the course stay the course Chris I can't prove it, but I know what I know. That is my truth in this matter. But you know, even though angels can give us direction, it doesn't necessarily mean that we'll take it, right? Even if you are face to face with an angel, sometimes you say, no, I still want to do what I want to do. And we see these accounts in Scripture time and time again. And here's one great account in Numbers. We've got to go here. This is an incredible account. And what's happening here? is there was a, a wicked prophet, Balaam, okay? He was supernaturally equipped to be a prophet, but yet his heart wasn't right with God. He had the ability to bring forth curse and blessing. Not every prophet had that, but he did. But God knew his heart. But yet what was happening here in this time, King Balak knew that his territory was being influenced by the Israelites, and he was threatened. And he said, okay, I want, to, I want to go get Balaam. He says, I'm going to offer you a great reward. Curse the Israelites. Curse them. And Balaam had enough respect for God. And he says, well, I got to ask God first because uh, I kind of fear him a little bit. So he goes and, and God says, no, do not curse the people of Israel. 
And he goes back and he says, I can't do this. Well, they came back with even a greater offer, offered more money, more fame, more power, whatever it was. And he says, okay, I'll go ask God one more time. And God told him, you're not to do anything unless I tell you to. But God did allow him to go that next morning. And I want to read this passage to you because it's very important that we hear this. In Numbers 22, 21, it says, So the next morning Balaam got up, saddled his donkey, and started off with the Moabite officials. But God was angry that Balaam was going, so he sent the angel of the Lord to stand in the road to block his way. As Balaam and the two servants were riding along, Balaam's donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a sword drawn in his hand. The donkey bolted off the road into a field, but Balaam beat it and turned it back onto the road. What an incredible moment. We can't always see the supernatural. And sometimes we feel like our animals have kind of that sixth sense. They can kind of see things that we don't. Well, this was one of those occasions where this donkey was able to see the angel standing in resistance. Because God knew that his heart was not right and he was not going to allow him to go curse the Israelites. He may have said, no, I'm not going to do that. But yet, back in the mind, that reward, I'm going to have great fame if I just, just one curse. And God said, no way. It's not happening. So as this moved on, if you continue to read, I encourage you to read the story. It's absolutely amazing. The, the donkey moves on and, and sees this angel, this fierce angel holding the sword, and he kind of gets off the path. And Balaam says, oh, no, no, get back on the road, donkey. And he starts whipping this donkey, you bad donkey, and gets it back on the road. And once again, the angel is there. And the donkey goes to veer off the road and pushes him up against the mountainside. And Balaam's sitting there going, wait a minute. I'm the boss here. You're the donkey. He gets off the donkey and beats the crap out of the donkey and says, get back on the road. Seriously. And the donkey gets back on. He goes on again. And the angel steps back. And he stands there with his sword drawn. And that donkey comes and kneels down before the angel. He didn't want any of that. He saw what it was. And Balaam gets off and he says, you stupid donkey. And he starts beating it again. And I think God felt sorry for the donkey because everybody loves the little donkey. He's cute, you know. (laughs) And in that moment, something amazing happened. Something supernatural happened. The donkey started talking to him. The the donkey started talking to him. And something like this, "I I thought we were buddies, you know. What are you doing this? I've been faithful to you all these years. Why are you beating me? And the thing that's interesting when you read scripture, maybe I'm reading between the lines, there wasn't no moment where he's sitting there going, um, uh, donkey's talking to me. No, he started having a conversation with him. <laughs> he said, you made me look like a fool. He started having this full conversation with the donkey. And God probably said, enough, enough. And in that moment, he opened Balaam's eyes. And he saw this fierce angel standing there with sword drawn. And the angel said, you know what? I wasn't going to let you pass. If this donkey would not have stopped for you, I would have killed you, but not the donkey. So many times, we want to do what we want to do. And we don't listen to the voice of God. And sometimes we're just hell-bent that it's going to happen. We're going to do it. I don't care. I don't care what anybody says. It's getting done. Have you ever stopped to think that maybe those roadblocks that you have, maybe that pushback that you're getting, because God loves you enough to redirect you, that maybe there's an angel that we can't see trying to redirect us back onto the good path. Have you ever thought about that? It's scriptural. I'm not making this up. But yet we limit the impact that angels can have in our lives. But there's another thing that angels do besides just directing us. Second thing, angels can protect you from danger. Now, I know a lot of people would like to think that everybody has a guardian angel. But that's not biblical. That's not a biblical truth. Now, can angels bring forth protection? Absolutely. But that's at God's discretion. And I'll prove it to you. Because here in Psalms, chapter 91, verse 11, It says, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. So it is true that angels can come and bring protection. 
Why they don't protect us all the time, I can't answer that. I don't know why sometimes God intervenes as he does and other times that he doesn't. I believe it's his big picture, which is much bigger than my little brain. And he's always at work, and I have to trust him in that. But we see these things, and we have to believe that God is able to do this. I mean, I love this, this account in Daniel 6, 22. King Darius, he really liked Daniel, but the other officials didn't. So they, they kind of came up with this plan to kind of get Daniel in trouble because he prayed to God and God alone. And they came up with this idea to say, hey, let's make it mandatory that if anybody prays to anybody besides King Darius, they'll be thrown in the lion's den. King Darius is like, sounds great to me. I like to be worshipped. That's a good thing. But he forgot that Daniel was a man of God and he refused to pray to King Darius. And they threw him in the lion's den. And King Darius wasn't happy about this, but it was law. So he had to follow through with this. But this is the interesting thing when you look at this. In Daniel 6, 22, that next morning, and believe it or not, King Darius was anxious to find out. I hope nothing happened to him, but man, those lions were pretty hungry because that's kind of how we do it around here. But in verse 22, it says this, I love it. Daniel answered, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight, and I, am not wronged, I have not wronged you, your majesty. So it did happen. It is able to come in in something that seems unbelievable. But the angel stepped in and showed that protection. There's another great example of this in the New Testament. We see it time and time again. Here is Peter. He was locked up in prison. All he wanted to do was give the good news. But they didn't want to hear it. So they put him in, in jail. And here's the thing you have to realize in those times and place. Herod could have called for his life at any moment. Any moment he could have called for his life and ex executed him because of what he stood for. But yet this is what happened in Acts. In Acts chapter 12, <laughs> verse 7. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell. There you go. There's your white robes. I don't know, you know. There's a bright light. I lost my place here for a second. Hold on. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, Get dressed, put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me. The angel ordered. So he came in with some authority. Pretty interesting thing where there's some supernatural stuff happening the the chains fell off he escaped but this is the thing that so many people miss remember i said earlier that we don't pray to them but we pray for the angels to come and help if you go back and i encourage you to what you're going to find is right when he was thrown in jail what did church do oh woe is me no the church came together and they prayed they prayed for his deliverance lord deliver him did they pray for angels no they prayed for deliverance. And God sent the angel to deliver them, to protect them. And that's what we have to do, the prayer of protection. It's a spiritual, supernatural thing that God is allowing us to be. And I know this to be true. Just ask my mom. My mom prayed a spiritual prayer over me and my brother all of our lives. And God knows we needed it, okay? You know, my mom will tell you that I probably wore out two or three angels just protecting me. But she prayed with that sense. She didn't pray to an angel. She prayed to God, Lord, send your angels, please, to protect them. And they did. And they have. And it's absolutely amazing when that happens. But the third thing that we see here is angels minister to you. They minister to you. It's a real thing. In Hebrews, and, and we look at this in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. So there's a condition here, a relationship happening here for the impact of angels in our lives, both in the spiritual and physical world. It says, for those who inherit salvation. 
It's interesting when you look at this because this was the case even for the one who gave salvation, Jesus. As he walked on this earth, he chose to live in the limitations of this physical body. And as he walked this earth, he was so thankful that angels came to him and tended to him. We see this account after 40 days of fasting. He was taken out and tempted, right? By the devil, Lucifer, the adversary. And he fought that battle. He resisted those temptations. He used the word of God. But at the end of the time, at the end of the battle, was he victorious? Yes. But we also know that he was exhausted, emotionally exhausted, physically exhausted, spiritually exhausted, because it's a real battle against us on every level. But this is what I see happening. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, at the end of this battle, it says, Then the devil went away, and angels came and took care of Jesus. Wait a minute. Why? Isn't Jesus the son of God? Why would he need angels to tend to him? Because he lived in the limitations of this physical body. He knows what we need in this battle. And those angels came in and ministered to him, gave him what it was needed. The word that's translated here is a very interesting word from the Greek. It's the word diakono. And what it really means is this, to be an attendant. It means to tend to as one of a friend. And that's exactly what the angel did with Jesus. Came and tended to him as a friend. Very relational. And gave him the strength to endure that battle. But even in this, we see another an example with Jesus, which is extended to us. That moment that Jesus is coming, facing the cross, knowing everything that was in front of him. We find him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's praying. In fact, in his human spirit, he's sitting there going, God, if there's any way that this can pass, please let it. I am in so much agony over this. But yet, what does Scripture tell us happened in this particular moment? In Luke 22, 43, it says, Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. In that moment of agony, an angel appeared and strengthened him. But you know what it says next verse? strengthened him, and he prayed more fervently. He didn't just take the strength for his own. He was strengthened so he could continue to battle. There was still more to come, and he needed that strengthening, that encouragement that was there. You know, too many times we allow the word to speak to our physical limitations, and we forget about our spiritual battle that's in front of us. We need to understand that there's both elements going on and we need as much help as we can. We need the angels to be warriors for us. We need to be redirected at times. But angels contend to us, it wasn't just for Jesus, it was for all who inherit salvation. That's what scripture tells me. So what that means for me is, if you're facing a challenge today, in your marriage, if you're overwhelmed in that moment, you're without work and you don't know what's happening, if you're if you are so drugged out, physically, emotionally, there's nothing left, why haven't you asked? Did God send me a ministering angel? Scripture tells us that we do not have because we do not ask. And so many times we limit our ability to walk in the physical because we've limited ourselves in the spiritual. When is the last time you said, God, Protect my children. God, send a ministering angel to me. I need help. I need strengthened so I can fervently pray for the next thing. This is what we have. But so many times we miss it. We miss the beauty of the supernatural when it comes to angels. I hope that you go away today encouraged and realizing that God is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? And whoever is against us they're going to have a battle on their hands because the angels of God, they're coming. They're coming to defend us. They're coming to defend his glory. And I pray that you would understand this beautiful account of scripture. Let's pray. Father, we can't always wrap our minds around how this supernatural works. Can we prove, disprove angels? 
I see the evidence. I see the impact. And Father, I'm thankful that you have allowed us to know this truth. I'm thankful that you allowed John to see in to what the depths of this means. But Lord, I pray that we would never worship anyone besides you. That though we have the Holy Spirit and it empowers us, it's to empower us to look back to you. If we are sent an angel to guard, protect, provide, it's to bring our eyes and our glory back to you. It is always about you and always will be about you. And I pray that we will have this in common with angels, that we will be found as worshipers, that we will be proclaiming the goodness of God every day of our lives, that we will be the warriors, the ones that are willing to battle for the kingdom of God is near. And I pray that we would be the messengers, that we would go forth and give the good news of Jesus Christ. But Father, we thank you that we're not alone. Open our eyes. Let us see all that there is to know and discover. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.